long as you're going to be speaking. As long as you'll let me speak. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll probably need whatever the allotted time wants. Uh, we, we, have, we have a lot of wiggle room in this schedule. Oh, well. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Uh, just of interest, uh, the fellow we're going to talk about has probably had as many books written about him as just about any other human being, uh, and that's uh, Thomas Jefferson. I was just wanted to mention before we get started, uh, there's, I've got now in my possession about 10 or 11 books about him, and uh, uh, it's very interesting, a very interesting character. But uh, what I was going to say is, actually, the, the book that you might find most helpful is uh, an easy one, and uh, that is uh, Alf Mapp Jr., who recently deceased, uh, wrote a book called The Faiths of Our Fathers, and he writes about the various uh, uh, fathers of uh, the American nation, and uh, he only devotes one chapter to each one, so uh, at least to the ones he focuses on. One of those is Thomas Jefferson, chapter one, in fact. Uh, but it's interesting that uh, in his one chapter, he seems to say more useful stuff, <laughs> uh, uh, things of interest to us, than uh, do a lot of the others in their entire books. But anyway, so it's easy, and uh, but it's a good book. This one is just an absolute classic. You may have seen it around, but Sworn on the Altar of God, quoting uh, Jefferson. Uh, one of his more famous quotes. And uh, recently, this one, which is of interest, uh, uh, Andrew Burstein's book, Jefferson's Secrets, and, uh, uh, and there's a bunch of others. Like I said, I've got probably 10 or 11 myself. I'm not uh, obsessed with uh, Jefferson, uh, but I have had some interest in him for quite some years. And, uh, He's recognized for us as a brilliant genius. Oh, my land, yes, a tremendous. And uh, so, uh, uh, anyway, I, th I think what has interested me in him uh, was not his presidency uh, so much as things that I think might be of interest to us in our faith and, uh, and those issues. So we'll try to take a candid look at that today. And... Uh, and this is going to be obviously a, 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 a rather brief overview, if you will. Uh, and I'm not an expert on Jefferson at all, uh, but I do find it interesting. I thought you would find these interesting uh, things as well. Uh, actually, this wasn't my idea. It was uh, our captain here who last year said, why don't you do something on Jefferson? And, uh, and I said, I will. And here we are. So... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, uh, actually, as this little project has evolved over the last year, um, it's interesting that uh, we found that maybe what may be of greatest interest to us about Jefferson is that he had a non-Trinitarian perspective about God. Very interesting. So here's a president of the United States who was non-Trinitarian in his understanding of the Scriptures. Uh, and there's no question about that. We're not, we're not making that up. It's true. Uh, but also, there were other uh, early American presidents, uh, particularly John Adams, the second president. Jefferson was our third. And, uh, and then John Quincy Adams, uh, who was the, I think, sixth president. Uh, also, the Adamses were non-Trinitarian guys. And uh, so I thought, well, what uh, we thought we might do is uh, uh, not only make a, a little project of this for our benefit here, but uh, Sharon and I had uh, thought, well, maybe we could do a little documentary and uh, title it Our Non-Trinitarian Presidents and actually take into account uh, these three and then there's some uh, possibilities, some others who were not... Uh, uh, so uh, keen about the uh, Trinity as well. So uh, anyway, so we thought we might do a documentary on that. The documentary is what we wish we had for you today. I was hoping to, I'd like to have brought the completed documentary DVD and just be able to give everyone one. And uh, 
But uh, we've been hindered on the home front uh, and uh, not able to do that. So maybe by next year we'll have it and we'll have the Adamses as well. Today's not about the Adamses. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I'll, uh, I'll let you know more about it. Anyway, our non-Trinitarian presidents is what we're kind of thinking about. So you're getting a sort of a preview of what may become a documentary that we can uh, put on our our uh, website. That's that's kind of I thought maybe that would catch the attention of some people out there when you start. Thinking, you know, you've got to be a trin, you know trinitarian to be a Christian and all these sorts of things. And uh, it's interesting. Maybe this would get the attention of folks and, uh, along the way who might say, "Well, what's that all about?" And we can perhaps show them. So uh, anyway, in that series, then. What we're going to be talking about today is actually part two, and that's Thomas Jefferson. We, because in the series, if we do the documentary, part one would be John Adams, we think. So uh, that, that's, that's that. So anyway, uh, we, in conjunction with this, we got so happy, we took a, uh, a vacation, we had an opportunity to, went up this eastern seaboard bit, and went by Monticello, and... Uh, uh, the uh, and saw Jefferson's place, spent a little time there, and uh, and then we went from there on up to Quincy, Massachusetts, and saw where the uh, Adams is hung at. And uh, but we what we have is we actually have some actual videoing going on in these locations, and uh, some uh, things that will be in the actual documentary itself. And uh, but we we don't have that here, unfortunately. Uh, but anyway, that's at, uh, that's at Monticello, uh, Jefferson's home, which he uh, designed and built. It's uh, uh, quite exciting. But uh, he is one of our most celebrated presidents, uh, one of the four presidents whose image is carved on Mount Rushmore. That's, that's exciting. Uh, there are many locations that are named after him, including Jefferson City, Missouri, for some of you who may have been through there. Uh, many people who are watching this presentation are carrying his image and a picture of his house. If you have a nickel, you've got Jefferson on one side and his house on the opposite. Now, what do you think of that? that that's pretty amazing. Huh? <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, uh, and then, of course, uh, he has his own memorial in, uh, in Washington, D.C., a very impressive one. Uh, and it's uh, fantastic. We visited there also on our trip and took some uh, some video there as well that will be in the actual documentary to get that completed. So why uh, is he honored in such ways? Why is it? Well, he was an outstanding father of our country. He wrote our country's birth certificate in a way. The, uh, he was the primary author of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. So, uh, and it turns out, brilliant writer, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident. That came from, from uh, Mr. Jefferson. He was the author of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom in 1777, which he was extremely proud of, and we're going to talk about that briefly today. Uh, in some ways, it had more effect on the world than did the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it's a very powerful document. Anyway, uh, he drafted it for the state of Virginia uh, in around 1777, just a year after the Declaration of Independence, and, but it wasn't adopted. It was pretty controversial and all that until 1785. He was actually in France at the time. Uh, he got word that it had finally been adopted by the, uh, the legislature in Virginia. He was the minister to France uh, in the vicinity of 1784 to 89 for the United States. He was the first Secretary of State of the United States under George Washington from 1790 to 1793. Pretty good, right? I, I think that would be plenty for a fellow to have done. Well, he's not done yet. He was also Vice President from 1797 to 1801. Third President of the United States from 1801 to 1809 served two terms and uh, had a bit of a battle in that first election, the 1801 thing. Uh, but by the second uh, election, he, he came in very, very strong. 
Here's something that people don't realize. He, he concluded the Louisiana Purchase from France. He was on good footing with France. And uh, uh, the, uh, he effectively doubled the size of our country. So if you're an American, that, I guess, is big. Well, that could be speaking French over there and, you know, across the Mississippi. But, Most of us here live in the Louisiana Purchase. Well, that's, well there you go. That, that's right. A good point. So, uh, but anyway, that's true. In 1803, he doubled the size of the United States. It was really an exciting thing, which for him was out of character. Politically, uh, he was a Republican. In those days, it meant, well, kind of what Republican still means, the favoring smaller government and all of that. This was a huge expansion of governmental effort and power on his part, more something that you would have expected from the Federalists. But no, it was, uh, it was he himself who could not pass up the opportunity to buy all that land for pittance, which he did. Uh, anyway, he retired from public life in 1809, and, uh, but lived on for some years. As if that weren't enough, he was a lawyer, he was an architect. I didn't know this until I got to researching a little bit about him. He was a violinist, for goodness sakes, and a pretty good one. Uh, they said he used to practice three hours every day on his violin, uh, and he was good enough at it that he was invited to the uh, to the governor's house to play in uh, Virginia. So I thought that's exciting. Uh, he was the actual governor of Virginia, and he was the representative of the House of Burgesses uh, there. He was founder of the University of Virginia in 1819. He's particularly proud of that, uh, and that again was in his post-presidential years. Now we're looking at 1819. He uh, donated, oh, well, he was supposedly sold, but effectively was like a donation, 6,700 books from his personal library, uh, which formed the nucleus of the Library of Congress, which, of course, as you probably know, is the largest library in the world now. Uh, but it started out with 6,700 of his books. How do you get 6,700 books? Now, Anthony may be pushing it pretty hard. I don't know. We, could, we, could we get your books to, to do a new Library of Congress thing or something? We didn't do it's, probably, uh, it's probably why he didn't have enough money to finish actually building on the show. That's right. Though I do understand he kept tearing things out and rebuilding. He kept ch changing, too. So. Uh, this is an interesting thing. He wrote almost 20,000 letters in his lifetime. How do you do that? I can't answer my emails. I've never said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Almost 20,000 letters. This is an amazing thing. And uh, uh, which I'm um, to remind me to mention to you may have heard, but uh, President Kennedy, uh, when he was in the White House, uh, did a, uh, uh, a special dinner for uh, uh, Nobel laureates from the United States, American living uh, Nobel laureates. <laughs> And uh, so they had all these Nobel laureates together. This really did happen. Anyway, President Kennedy got and addressed them and said, uh, this is probably the greatest assemblage of brain power to be here in the White House since Thomas Jefferson dined here alone. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the guy that we're talking about, right? <laughs> But must move to the question about Jefferson and religion, and uh, he was uh, controversial religiously, but uh, let's, let's see what we can learn about it. I said maybe this is Jefferson's last secret, spelled with an E. <laughs> they used to spell it that way, I want you to know that. <laughs> they just didn't say a need for that last E after a while. I had to tell my teacher that too, it didn't work. It didn't work, okay. <laughs> Um, the, uh, uh, the face of our father's book I mentioned to you, there's this statement on there. This man who often spoke unguardedly on many matters was extremely reticent on the subject of his faith, particularly his own personal faith. So he didn't have much to say about it. And uh, uh, that's interesting. I made uh, this comment then. Let, uh, let he left him, because he was... Uh, not very verbal about it. It left him uh, very open to speculation in his lifetime, uh, skepticism and criticism by others. If, if he wouldn't say, then you get to make it up yourself what you say 
you know, about him, and, uh, and that was good. So, um, so my question here is, and maybe this is important to us, from our perspective then, we want to know what was he really thinking about his own faith and religion. And uh, uh, so uh, I did get to uh, that close to him. <laughs> close enough to do a mind meld maybe of some sort, but uh, I, I, did, I don't know. We'll see what, what we get out of this. But he was tall, wasn't he? Or else I'm extraordinarily short. I don't think, but he, he actually was tall. He was a tall fellow. Yeah. <clears throat> what did Jefferson think about religion? Um, a note says maybe it is better to ask when did he think some things about religion because he was a developing fellow. Uh, and as he went along in life, I think we see transitions occurring. And uh, uh, if you're looking at one moment in his life you're m and just registering that, uh, then you may be missing uh, the, the big picture. Uh, it would be kind of like saying, a uh, hundred years from now, someone talking about Anthony Buzzard and saying, oh yeah, he was Church of England guy. Well, he was, but that doesn't begin to tell you the whole story. And so I think it's one of the biggest mistakes we make when we're looking into history is to see people as being static. They're, they're often not. Sometimes they are, but, but often uh, in... in uh, uh, and this is the case with Jefferson. He's, he's developing along the way. If you're uh, asking what did he believe as a youth, I think uh, when he was at William & Mary, uh, started there about the age of 16, um, he may have been, uh, some would say, uh, that he was uh, atheistic, not very likely agnostic, very possibly. He just was doubtful about the whole business of God for a while. As a young legislator and revolutionary, his, his thoughts kept developing. And as president of the United States, we'll discover that begins his interest, uh, in that period, begins his real interest in this non-Trinitarian business. Uh, we'll take another look at that in a minute. And uh, as the accomplished, experienced man of his retirement years, his late years, where was he at then? And uh, interestingly enough, because of his uh, uh, more willingness to talk about uh, his faith, I think those retirement years after he left public office, while he was in public office, he didn't want to make his faith a matter of public issue. It was very important to him to not do that. In fact, that was one of the problems he had, uh, the mixing of, of uh, one's faith and and state were a real problem for us, so we'll, we'll touch on that. But uh, in his later years, he uh, talks more freely about, I think, what his views had come to be, so anyway. And lots of letters, of, of course, always. <clears throat> I don't know, if there had already been the development of television, I don't think he would have written half that many letters. What do you think? <laughs> or movie, or something, you know. In texting. <laughs> That's right, he <laughs> did. Here's some things that I think, in conclusion, we basically can know. I'm, I'm concluding before we look at some of these issues. But uh, he was a person of faith. I, I think he was. He was a churchgoer all of his life. Uh, as a young fellow, he was brought up going to church, the Anglican church. And uh, he, uh, he went to church through his life. And even uh, as president, he attended church regularly in Washington. Uh, the, as we'll see a little bit later on here, he went to Unitarian churches and made friends of Unitarian uh, ministers. Uh, that, in fact, that was kind of a salvation to him. He was about thought there was no hope for for religion or or uh, the clergy. He was just really down on all that. But uh, there was some uh, Unitarian ministers who uh, uh, kind of saved him from that that thought. But he was a person of faith. He was, at best, I think, a lukewarm deist. I don't know how you'd be a lukewarm deist. <laughs> but uh, that's the thing everybody knows. Oh, Jefferson, what was about his religion? Oh, he was a deist. That's all anybody knows. Actually, I don't think that holds very well, and we'll talk about that a little bit. 
maybe not a DS at all as uh, would often be thought of it nowadays. If you're talking about uh, deism in, on the continent in Europe, uh, a deism that would be hard and fast, God, as uh, someone was mentioning earlier, played a few minutes uh, you know, God kind of wound the world up and set it on its way and walked off and forgot it. That's not Jefferson. He sees God busy in the affairs of state and the development of the new nation. He, he sees things differently from that. So when they say he's a deist, that's a little too dismissive. It's too quick. Uh, and I think he wasn't a deist at all uh, in his later life. Uh, in item three, he was in his later life definitely Unitarian. There's no question about that one. He was definitely non-Trinitarian. So we'll look at some of that. Here's where Jefferson becomes important to everybody. He had a sense of anti-tyranny uh, about the crown, uh, the, the king, you know, and so other Americans did at that time. Uh, but he was just down on the whole issue of the king and the state and all of that. And he saw established religion as part of the tyranny, part of the problem. So when he saw the king having sway and control over the minds of men, if you will, he saw that part of the problem was the church in league with the state was that tyranny. So Jefferson was very strong against the, the crown in England because he saw this tyranny, but he also turned that same kind of heart against uh, the, uh, uh, the, the organized church, which he saw as being part of the same tyranny. If, if you put them together, to him it was just worse than anything. You know, we've got the state, now the state takes on religion, and now we've got the worst of all worlds. And yet, that was the pattern that had been in place in Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, I think, as Eugene was mentioning uh, uh, last night uh, at the table, we uh, this whole idea of establishing the kingdom of God in the church, the church being the, the kingdom of God, Going all the way back to uh, the, the Roman Catholic roots of those ideas, uh, Jefferson saw this as terrible. He, he, in fact, I will say that Jefferson actually brought to bear something important in the turn of events in, in terms of reformation. And he wasn't really a reformationist. But what he did was he brought to the world the concept brought back to the world concept, that church and state should not be one entity, that it was, that it was impossible, that it wouldn't work. So as Eugene was mentioning, when the, when the Catholics had established this idea of control of state and merging of church and state, and that the church is the kingdom of God, okay, they, they had done that. But when the Protestants came on the scene, they much carried on some much of the same thinking. Much of the, except now they're going to do the same thing, except they're going to be in control and they're going to be in America doing it in many cases. Jefferson saw this and he just thought it was horrible. So he didn't care. He said the church, now talking about the Catholic Church, had in his view been abominable in what they had done in controlling uh, the hearts, minds, and face of men. <coughs> Uh, the church, in league with the state in Europe, had been terrible. And now what Jefferson is seeing is, he's saying, well, it doesn't have to be this way. In fact, it shouldn't be this way. And I think he's setting before the people the possibility, the idea that the church is not the kingdom. I think Jefferson was just a few years short of catching up to us in this particular point. He saw a break as being appropriate between church and state. And uh, we'll talk more about that. He said, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. That's hence this book that we 
convention, sworn on the altar of God. People picture that as relating to the crown. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, and it did. But what people don't realize is, for Jefferson, that was the church also. Very significant for him that uh, he would believe in By the way, I, this is just a, a note in passing. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had no middle name. I know that because I tracked it back and I thought, what is his middle name, Thomas Jefferson? He had no middle name. Uh, neither, he had, I think, 10 siblings and uh, uh, only two of them had middle names. So that was, I don't know what that means, but there you are. Just keep that in mind. So Jefferson was particularly anti-Catholic because of these issues, the tyranny problem. And he was particularly anti-Calvinist. Uh, he just really had problems with Calvinists all of his life. And in order to understand Jefferson, you've got to understand him in relationship to what he thought about the Calvinists. And, uh, and that's interesting. But uh, we get a little bit of that here. In this quote, Calvin worshipped, and I quote, a malignant demon and blasphemed God by the atrocious attributes that he gave to God. Jefferson attacked the five demoralizing dogmas of Calvin, which he identified as, and we all know the tulip business, right, and the, the five issues of principles of Calvinism. We mentioned the two here that Jefferson had such a huge problem with. Number one, he came to develop this problem. Number one, believing in three gods. He took the first affirmation of Calvinism that God is three. And Jefferson just flat out said, that's belief in three gods. You're not going to peddle this to me. He's not going to, he, he would not believe. So that was one thing. And that, that's where we begin to pick up, too, on this anti-Trinitarian business of this brilliant thought. The second one turns out to be important to Jefferson, too, and that is, he thought that they were absolutely demoralizing dogmas because of the denying of the importance of good works and love of neighbor. Uh, I don't have the time to pursue it all, but much of Jefferson's thinking along these lines developed in his White House years, during the time he was actually president. And during this time, uh, he focused on this and studied on Jesus. He got to studying on Jesus in part because of a, uh, a Unitarian fellow, uh, uh, and we'll talk about it in just a minute, but the, uh, uh, but uh, Priestley. Uh, but Jefferson, due to Priestley's influence, took a new look at Jesus, and he did some of his controversial writing about Jesus in the White House, but I think perhaps people are making too much of what he wrote in trying to sort out, and they said, you know, he took scissors to the Bible and took out everything. Uh, no one knows exactly what Jefferson was trying to prove by getting down to the sayings of Jesus. I think he wanted a collection of the sayings of Jesus. We're not sure what he meant beyond that. But, uh, but here's the problem. He fell in love with Jesus. At that point, he said, Jesus is teachings were the most sublime <coughs> teachings that had ever come forth uh, in humanity. So this is very tremendous. Here's the problem with the Calvinists. He saw the Calvinists as an opposition to that. That the Calvinists were saying, it doesn't matter what you do. Jesus is teaching this wonderful morality and character of humanity, and he, Jesus is bringing all these amazing things to bear more so than anyone had ever done before. And the Calvinists come along and say, oh, that doesn't really matter, because you're saved regardless of what you do and so on. Uh, this becomes the crux of, a, of another problem that we would have with Jefferson, and that is Jefferson listened to the messages of the Calvinists, and the Calvinists were going around quoting the Apostle Paul all the time, as they still often do. I don't know if you've noticed that. But... but, but from what the Calvinists were saying then uh, about it's not by works and so on and so forth, the Calvinists were saying, oh, 
Jefferson took great exception in saying, what you're saying is contrary to what Jesus actually taught, which he was very keen about good works and doing right things and judgment related to those things. So anyway, this begins to set up a, a difficulty for, uh, for Jefferson that we can appreciate, but I don't think we would need to feel like we've, we've got to disavow Paul, because I think when we get back to Paul, we're going to say, hey, Paul wasn't at odds with Jesus after all. I think it's the Calvinists who are saying that, and you shouldn't bite on, on that. But uh, anyway, uh, Jefferson had significant political and religious enemies. Uh, the Calvinists accused him of being an atheist. As you might imagine, they didn't like him at all. Uh, back during his, the uh, run for the presidency the first time, uh, they spread out broadly that he would empty every church in America and make them into brothels. They, uh, and this was really, this was huge. He barely took the presidency the first time. But uh, anyway, uh, and they refused to, uh, and he refused to deny the assertion that he was an atheist during the campaign. He would not address it because they kept coming at it. They say you're an atheist, they say you're not. He kept out of it brings us back to this question then. Uh, I don't believe he was ever really an atheist. Uh, that, uh, and the main reason was it was just illogical to him. Uh, Jefferson uh, may have, as we mentioned, had a rush with agnosticism when he was a young fellow uh, back at uh, uh, Mary, William, William Mary. But uh, I think Mapp says it this way, and uh, you can establish it by looking at other things, but at some point, agnosticism of his youth yielded to faith. Uh, he believed that the existence of creation presupposed a creator. He could just never make any sense out of atheism, So, and he moved <coughs> on, uh, away from, and all the way from agnosticism. Why did he not deny atheism? Why didn't he just come out and so on? Because I think he felt like that's biting on the what they're doing, and he and he, and he made statements instead. If if a fellow is an atheist, why does that change his ability to govern, or why does that uh, uh, change his ability to uh, hold public office, or if he believes whatever he believes, why should his faith be determined about what we're going to say about his ability to govern? This brings us back to the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which was very important to Jefferson. Um, and uh, his view was that religion should play no role in one's suitability for public office. He, uh, he, his reaction was to requirements they had in Virginia that a candidate for public office must not have denied being the being of God or God being a trinity. So Jefferson, in his years back there, took great offense. This is back in 77 and before uh, the writing of, the, uh, of this. But part of what mo motivated Jefferson about, let's get away from this, this whole church-state fusion business, was this kind of thing. And they're saying, if in his home state, he fought this, by the way. In his home state, if someone had ever written or said anything about denying the Trinity or not being Trinitarian, they could not hold public office. This was at the heart of Jefferson's decision to work on this business about the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom. Okay. By the way, the Statute for Religious Freedom is often, I think, misunderstood. It was not designed to, with so much thinking about your personal religious freedom in one way as it was thinking about the freedom of all churches to have even footing in terms of their legal standing and status in, in, in the law. So what Jefferson, <coughs> Jefferson, when he was a young fellow, had come up in the Anglican church the Church of England, and in the colonies at that time, even if you belonged to another church, 
you were likely to have laws that said, okay, you can go to your other church. You still have to attend a church of the Church of England so many times per year, and you have to tithe to the Church of England. Isn't this interesting? So you begin to get some, uh, some sense of what was motivating this fellow to, to begin to form such strong feelings. We can't do this. So when he was talking about for religious freedom, he wasn't just thinking only about individuals. He was thinking about the, the Anglican should have no advantage over the Baptist, the Methodist, or anyone else. And so from his perspective, everybody should have the same opportunities for presenting themselves before the public and let the public decide what they will believe and what they will like. So um, uh, it did say that uh, no religious view uh, should ever diminish, enlarge, or affect the civil capacity of a speaker or writer because they had written on a matter uh, it shouldn't prevent them from holding public office. Jefferson was so proud of the, sta the statute of, uh, of religious freedom, the Virginia statute, that he actually had that put on his tombstone, if you will. In fact, he left off the presidency. Maybe he just figured everybody would know that anyway. But anyway, <laughs> the things he wanted to mention uh, here was that he was the author of the Declaration of Independence, American Independence, but notice the next thing, and of the statute of Virginia for religious freedom. That was very important to him. So Jefferson was not a fellow out crusading as people now say, we don't want any prayers in our, our public forums. That wasn't him at all. So people are using Jefferson's idea of church and state as an excuse or some reason, he did use those words in a private letter. It was never in public uh, uh, documents. Uh, but his whole point was uh, God be revered, God be blessed, but nobody is going to have the advantage in this country of their particular church or their particular faith being favored by the state. And the, the statute of Virginia for religious freedom was very important because it's the first time it had ever really been put together in that way. And this will reverberate. You, we don't realize it, but in the United States, even some of the states continued to have state religion after after 1776, after that time, eventually it all died out. Jefferson fought hard because he didn't want to see the United States of America as a nation adopting any given religion, but providing opportunities for all religions. And uh, uh, so, and it did. But that carried on further. Then we we'll go back to Europe after a while, and they'll say, "Hey, this can be done. You know, the the sovereign can reign." without uh, having the approval of any particular church, so to speak, so to speak and so on. Okay. <coughs> Another thought, Jefferson was not, in my mind, a true deist. Now, it depends on how you define deism, but he may have entertained deism in measure along the way, and particularly in his younger years. But he did a lot of things, and I'm just highlighting some here, but he supported the National Day of Prayer, in the Declaration of Independence, he ended it with the words, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence. Well, you can't have God intervening with uh, his uh, protection for this, this endeavor that they were going on if, if you're thinking about actual total deism in that sense. In the European sense, uh, in that sense of deism, he wasn't. I think there's no question. Now, there were some who were, and uh, who were very strict deists. And that's, in his first inaugural address, he says, uh, he talks about an overruling providence, which by all of its dispensations proves that it delights in the happiness of man here and his greater happiness hereafter. It's kind of wordy and it's a little lofty, but basically he's saying uh, we're talking about an overruling providence 
a ruling providence, not a missing providence. There is, there's, God's involved here. In his second inaugural address, I think he got even stronger. He says, I shall need, speaking to the people, he says, I will need, to favor of that being in whose hands we are, who led our forefathers as Israel of old, from their native land and planted them in a country flowing with all the necessaries and comforts of life, who has covered our infancy with his providence and our riper years with his wisdom and power, and whose goodness I ask you to join with me in supplications that he will delight, enlighten the minds of your servants, guide their counsels, and prosper their measures, that what's so ever they do shall result in your good and secure to you the peace, friendship, and approbation of all nations. This was at the second and all. But you can't, I, I can't imagine, you know, either he's just a flat-out liar and not a man of conscience, so he'll just get up and say this, or else he really meant it. And I think it, clearly at this point in his life, he's not deistic. He's, he's talking about needing the favor of that being in whose hands we are and who led our forefathers as of Israel of old. I've read some, too, about his... He was really fascinated with God leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, and he did see parallels between that and what he saw in the new nation here. <coughs> so, uh, but we need his help. I need his help. Me and all these who will govern with me, uh, we need uh, the enlightenment of our minds from him. So the enlightenment was not something apart from God, but for Jefferson, we're enlightening. The idea of being enlightened and having your mind enlightened uh, is, uh, is indeed with them. So the term deist, this is interesting too, was sometimes used to indicate anyone who denied the Trinity. You know, we have shifting in terms of language and, and phrase, but one biographer uh, indicates, uh, in fact, this is bursting, when Jefferson used the term deism with reference to the teachings of Jesus, or the religion of the Jews, he understood the word to mean belief in one God. So to, to Jefferson, the Jews were deists. Well, he, did he mean that he they thought, the Jews all thought that God went away and left there? No. He meant, by his use of the term in, in this way, uh, deism was the belief in the unity of God, the singularity of God. Very interesting. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the atheism business and the agnosticism business, and uh, we talked about the deism business, which I think has been much overdone. Uh, uh, let's look at the, uh, the Unitarian Jefferson. And uh, this brings us particularly, as I say here, to his later non-public years. Uh, we got a lot of his writings in those years, but it was during his presidency the eight years of his presidency, that a lot of this took shape. Uh, Jefferson became friends with Joseph Priestley, okay, Unitarian minister from England. He came to the United States in 1994, uh, a little bit before uh, Jefferson became uh, president. But anyway, Jefferson, met, he got ran out of England, by the way, uh, by, let's see, uh, yeah, the Trinitarian people over there. <laughs> the, they, uh, they burned his house, burned his church, and uh, finally uh, his friends insisted, you've got to get out of here. And uh, so he did, uh, he, lived, he left and came to the States and, and brought his uh, Unitarian understanding of God with him uh, and did a lot of good. Anyway, he became friends of uh, uh, a number of important people in America, but Jefferson uh, being among those. And Jefferson, I think, was very influenced by... Uh, Priestley in those later years. Uh, also, something else that happened in his post-presidential years, uh, he kindled a new friendship, rekindled a friendship, perhaps with political adversary uh, John Adams, uh, who had long time been a Unitarian. John Adams uh, had expressly said he was a Unitarian for 60-something years. Uh, so, uh, uh, all of a sudden, we find Jefferson in uh, in a world of people who are non-Trinitarian, uh, 
Christians and believing in God, but believing that God is one and believing in the unity of God as opposed to multiple. By the way, people don't know this. You know, we've got a lot of... We, have, we, we need to better educate our friends, I think, and let them know, hey, you know, did you know that the two of the first three presidents of the United States were non-Trinitarian guys? And they had reasons for believing that, too, what they believed. Uh, they could explain it to you real quick. And it's many of the same things that we would say today. Jefferson writing to Adams regarding the Trinity, and I'm just picking up a few of these. They exchanged a lot of them. Here's what Jefferson said. This is what made sense to him. He said, ideas must be distinct before reason can act upon them. And no man ever had a distinct idea of the Trinity. It is the mere abracadabra. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, that's theological term. I, my, my, my wife Sharon was looking at that, and she said, what is this word, A, B? <laughs> Finally, she got through it and said, oh, abracadabra. <laughs> the abracadabra of the Montebacs calling themselves priests of Jesus. Wow. He didn't uh, have a lot of reserve about going on uh, the, uh, the attack here. But, uh, but notice he says, no man ever had a distinct idea of the Trinity, period. Uh, then this, uh, I think it's a wonderful statement. This is from uh, Jefferson to, uh, to Adams again. It is too late in the day for men, that's supposed to be men, men of sincerity, to pretend they believe in the Platonic mysticisms. Ha! Ah, another point we'd like to make. Platonic mysticisms that there are, that three are one, and one is three, and yet that the one is not three, and the three are not one. But this constitutes the craft, the power, and the profit, P R O F I T, of the priests. Wow. By the way, you use priests sometimes in a, in a rather pejorative way to speak of the clergy, the, the clergy overall. But, uh, but anyway, this is very clearly, we're looking at his post-presidential years. This is a guy who's taken a look at all of this and said, you know, it's too late in the day for people to be coming telling us that three is one and one is three. You know, or all of this sort of business. It doesn't work. He wrote this very Trinitarian, non-Trinitarian, Unitarian statement to Adams in 1823. He says, Jefferson, oh, this is of this. He said, Jefferson espoused the traditional view of eternal life. This is a map saying this. He said that like Adams, in contemplating death, he was content to submit to the will of, listen to this wonderful Unitarian phrase, the God of Jesus and our God. Does that sound like something you probably said? So he's looking uh, in 1823 and he's getting to in his twilight years and he's saying, you know, may not be here too much longer. Uh, time's kind of fading on out. But he says uh, that in contemplating death, he's willing to submit to the will of, this is not a deistic statement again, right? I mean, if God's off somewhere, you don't care when you die or how or nothing about it. But this is not so here. This guy cares. The, uh, he says, he's content to submit to the will of the God of Jesus. I just think, this is, this is our guy. This is wonderful. I like it a lot. <coughs> there were, we think, we were, as we would see it, maybe not everyone, problem areas, and we could devote a whole session to some of these issues, okay? And, uh, but uh, as nearly as I can determine at this point, and I'm still working on these issues, but, uh, and kind of researching, but we, at least I say we, most of us, uh, Church of God uh, folks, we would probably have some difficulties here, and some of it's significant. Anyway, he was supposed he never would adopt the idea of virgin birth. But I think he may have gotten that a bit from Priestley, who also was skeptical of virgin birth. Someone can correct me on that. But uh, uh, this is, from our perspective, needless. I mean, where do you, how do you come to that? But anyway, that's another I don't want to go into. It. However, this was more significant, and this is important to us, I think. He opposed the resurrection. He just thought the resurrection can't be true. 
So he's in there kind of picking and choosing, I think, at this point. And that's really, and that's not Priestley's view, as I understand. Uh, Priestley was a record resurrectionist guy. He disliked Paul and disallowed his writings. He just finally just broke Paul off. And that's pretty awful. I do think that, that what got him going on that business was an overreaction to the Calvinists. I, I could I could have brought you some quotes about the Calvinists and you just you they would make your hair stand up again. <laughs> very 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 strongly against the Calvinists. He just thought they did they did a terrible disservice to humanity. But uh, but his thing was he felt like the Calvinists were opposing Jesus. It's ridiculous. Jesus is out there teaching uh, the greatest morals and teachings and 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 character that in the human in the in human in humanity in the in our race. And he's the the Calvinists come along and say, oh, by the way, none of that matters. It doesn't matter. You'll just be saved if you're going to be saved, and you're not going to be saved if you're not going to be saved. And it doesn't matter how you live or how you conduct yourself, whether you sin or whether you don't. And if you're saved, you're saved forever and stuff like that. He found terrible exception to that. He saw that as being in opposition to all what he thought were the clear teachings of Jesus. So I think he was overreacting to the Calvinists a bit in deciding to throw out Paul. Because the Paul, they kept throwing Paul at him. They're saying, well, Paul said this and Paul said <coughs> So finally, he bit on it. I think we would probably like to sit down with Jefferson and talk to him about this and say, wait a minute, you're dismissing Paul too quickly. Uh, Paul really was on Jesus' side. <laughs> so you have to get it all in perspective. But uh, he did believe, and this I find very interesting, he believed in an afterlife, but he's disallowed the resurrection. So I think he just got hung up here, the poor guy, you know. And he was very anti-Platonic. He was very much, he thought Platonism was awful. Well, he was on the right track there. But his problem was he didn't see uh, the contradiction uh, in his deciding that there was no resurrection. And in, he did believe in an afterlife. So how do you get there, Thomas? What's going to go on? You know, how do you do this? And I think what he's done, without probably intending to, I don't know, uh, he's, he's boxed himself into the problem of saying, well, we'll get there, I guess, by an immortal soul or something. But that's platonic. So what, what, is, what is he going to do here? So anyway, these are problem areas that... Uh, uh, that were very, uh, very significant, very serious. And like I said, we could do a whole session just talking about these issues as they related to him. Here's what I see as being uh, the bottom line for us, though, and things of interest to us uh, on the positive side, and that's what we're interested in today. He was a great thinker, and I believe he was a sincere person. Um, the, uh, he did embrace an active God, he was not much of a deist at any point in his life, if ever. Um, he embraced the unity of God and was opposed to the Trinity. Voila, that's the reason for this particular presentation today. He did believe in judgment, and he believed in an afterlife. And uh, so those things are awfully good. Uh, here's something important, I think. Uh, I think he saved Christianity from itself. What was happening in the United States of America was a repetition of what had always been happening in Europe, and that is struggling, infighting between states with one another, religions with one another uh, since the Protestant Reformation, and here they are, they're at one another and actually aligning with each other so that the state and various religious groups are, are coming together. So even in England, uh, you know, uh, Jefferson's original home, so to speak, home place, they had aligned church and state, except now it's got to be the Church of England. Okay. What Jefferson did was he came along and I think he said, you know, we don't have to have that. We can have the state doing its job. We can let the churches all compete freely with one another and let the public decide what they like, what they believe. And let the church not intervene in that or interfere with it. <laughs> that's Jefferson's true wall. 
of separation between church and state. It has nothing to do with the way that's being misused, I think, by a lot of people today. So, uh, but uh, in the process, I think that Jefferson broke this notion in a way that the church is the kingdom on earth. Think about it. At the time he's writing this, basically everybody's thinking that way. In case you haven't noticed, most people still are in some way, shape, or form. We, did, we seem to have that problem. But Jefferson, without necessarily trying to solve the problem from a religious standpoint, he's trying to just solve it from a practical standpoint, a human standpoint. You know, he, he's, he's sworn on the altar of God to oppose every tyranny against the mind of man. He says, you know, the state's been tyranny against the mind of man and, and various churches have and when you put them together it's the worst of all so he's against all of that but by breaking it he actually kind of comes in just a few years he died in 1826 July the 4th 1826 by the way 50 years to the day after the signing of the Declaration of Independence what you may not also know is as long as we're getting this little sign uh that's also the same day that uh, John Adams died, July the 4th, uh, 1826, 50 days, two of them. And those were only, I don't know who the other guy was, but there was only three George of the original sign. Who was it? George Washington. Was it Washington? It may have been. No, no, he died earlier, didn't he? Well, yeah, but I think he died on the 4th. Oh, he may have died on the 4th, okay. But at the time these two guys died, I think there was one other guy that remained out of the 50 one or however many original signs there were. So anyway, that's interesting. But uh, here's what I think. He was just a few years, a little too soon, before beginning to pick up on this true restoration of our planet Earth and the kingdom of God on Earth. He was so close. He was the one helping, I think, in a way, I, he helped break the idea that it couldn't be any other way. You had to have church and state. And what he did, I think, brought us to the point of realizing, no, this can be done a different way. And then it's only 1826, so that you don't have to come far, far uh, from that until we have people now bringing us. I'm not saying it's a direct connection to Jefferson in that, but we have people beginning to say, hey, the kingdom of God is coming. And it's not something we're doing. It's not something we've done here, but the kingdom of God is coming. So... I think Jefferson helped. Uh, so here's my, my bottom line with Jefferson. I think he was a guy we could talk to. And I think he would be interested in what we had to say. I'd really like to help him out on the uh, on the <laughs> business with Paul. That really bothers me because, uh, you know, we I'm, I'm really fond of Paul myself. I think he's really a sharp guy. <laughs> he may not have written 20,000 letters in his lifetime, but the letters that Paul wrote to me were better than any of the Jefferson wrote. So I, I really like I really like Paul's stuff, and uh, so that's a, a bit of a problem. But Jefferson we could talk to. He would be interested in the things that we're saying. I really believe he would, including something that I think he just missed, and that is the kingdom of God coming uh, in, the, in the future. He didn't see that, but if we could have got to him, I think he would have listened to it. What do you think? Oh, that's right. So, so there you are. That's, 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 that's. Dan, have you got this in a paper or anything that we could put up? Or? I, I do not, and uh, the uh, I do have the uh, the slideshow. Thank you very much.